how I act and work on scripts is that I get offered something and yeah, I look, I open up some arbitrary page and read a couple lines and it looks like the sort of stuff I could say. And it can pay me, I do it. So, when I did this, I had done the roost, which was, I don't know what to do that, but, um, it was a, but I, I got this gig and I went and shot it and I'd never read the script. Anyway, I just read my lines and I knew those scenes, so they asked me to come to the, uh, what do you call it, the, the Tribeca Film Festival, because it was one of the opening films. And so I said, oh, okay, I'll go, because it's, you know, it was a good movie, and these people struggle to get money to make movies. And so I come in, and I sit down, and I start watching this thing, and it's like, get me the fuck out of here. This <laughs> <laughs> is really scary. <laughs> I couldn't leave, because I was sort of one of the notables. <laughs> and I had a sister, and it felt the same way tonight. It's like, Shit, I forgot how. It's very well done. I mean, it's, it's yeah. suspenseful. Um, and then there's some really great jump scares. Did you, were you guys jumping during the film? Yeah. Um, so you hadn't seen, you hadn't read the full script when you took the job. No. How did the script, how did the script come to you for House of Devil? Did they, were you, did they want you well, for this role? That's another thing. So I, I'd done, you know, The Roost. And then somebody sent me a, a clipping from um, the casting, some sort of casting news or something, and, and it listed the people who were going to be in it, and it said Mr. Holman. It was a long description of this guy, and it was like a description of me. <laughs> so I called up Fat Larry Fessenden, who's, I guess, I don't know if you know who he is, He's, he makes a lot of these scary movies and he produces a lot of Thai stuff. And I, I called him up and I said, why, why are you just hire me? Why are you doing this to me? Because <laughs> I did that other thing and I can't do something else. So they, then they hire me. I don't know if it was a way not to pay me as much as they were, but it was, it was some weird sort of thing. And this, you know, how, how long was she with this for you? This is a couple of weeks. Okay. Like two weeks, maybe. And then they. You know, I mean, they, this, I, I wanted, they wanted to, I kept saying, let's do the sequel, man. Let's do the sequel. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. I, it's, I, I'd be, I'd live. I was the only one who lived. Yeah. You made a fucking coma. <laughs> <laughs> you got the baby. Right. Yeah. So this is like, what, make this movie, and they, and they never have. So I am ha I'm happy that the baby makes it, too. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that says, I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> um, but you, you had, You've had a great career playing, playing some scary characters. Um, I was wondering if we talk about, is there anything that you attribute that to? What do you think? Why I get stuck in those parts? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, you're very good at it. Is there, can you pinpoint like what it is that, that makes you so good for these roles? I think I'm just creepy. That's <laughs> <laughs> Even my kids think I'm crazy. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, you do a couple of these things and then people start seeing you, you know, and the whole sort of vibe in the world sure. puts you in that place and, you know, it's not their fault. I mean, I can't. You know. I started the first play, I did a play called Buried Child by Sam Shepard. Right. And, and, and I play this part that's sort of sweet and, but he's fucking kind of scary. And then you just get, cast and stuff like that. And, and it sort of builds up a momentum and... You come down and it's like, okay, I can do this. Yeah, and then like, like I did this movie, um, The Pledge, for Sean Penn. Right. And the script, the idea that I, he called me up at home and said, I don't want you to be in this movie. And I said, yeah. He said, but I don't want you to be like the killer. Everybody thinks you're going to be what people think is going to be. But what happened was they ran out of money when they were shooting. It's a long story. There's a Battleship Earth movie. Everybody heard of this one? <laughs> this Arab cleaning magnate, you know, dry cleaning magnates in Canada had all this money. And they made Battleship Earth. And we were shooting Pledge at the same time. And Battleship, well, they, they finished a little earlier. So they, we were shooting and we were like, five weeks out of eight weeks or something, like two-thirds of the way through, and um, Battle's Your Birth opens and like two people go to it. <laughs> and these guys, these cleaning guys, got just destroyed. 
So they just called up Sean and said, that's it, we're not shooting anymore. And I, there were all these scenes that I had in there that made it that I wasn't the bad guy. But of course they didn't shoot those now, so... Everybody goes, no, you're the bad guy. Now. I just, I just rewatched. Um, Manhunter. Uh, it made me it made me nervous to meet you. <laughs> um, but you're yeah. but you're real cool. You're much cooler than Francis Dollarhide. But it's, I like the story that you tell. I heard you tell a story about the how you were the process of being cast for that part. Oh, is that interesting to you? I think, I think yeah, it's, I, I think it's a fun story. <laughs> So Michael Mann, I think, wanted to use Steppenwolf people. I don't know if anyone knows what Steppenwolf is, uh, yeah. Chicago Theater Company. And he wanted Malkovich and Gary Sinise and Stephen Lang and all these people, to, and all the, he wanted a whole cast of those people. Um, I didn't know this. So, they, so I, got, I got the script and I read it, and I thought, oh, she's like, oh. So I go to the audition, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and my appointment's like 10.30 or something. But all these guys start coming in, like Malkovich, and all these people just come in, and they just take them in right away to, to meet Michael Mann. And just leave me sitting out there like an asshole. <laughs> for like hours. It went on for a couple hours, I sat there. And I was thinking, oh, fuck, get out of here. <laughs> so finally, they have me come in. And at this point, I'm so pissed off. And I come in, and Michael Mann starts to talk. And I said, no, don't talk. I, I'm going to read, and I'm going to leave. <laughs> OK? And he says, sure. And so I started to read, and there was this casting, this woman, was, I think she had just been started casting. She was not a very experienced person. But somehow I, I started terrifying her. I, don't know, I wasn't doing anything. I was just sort of reading, but I was really mad. And I could feel Michael Mann like drifting around the room, and I could tell he was digging what I was doing. And I thought, I got the part. This is great. So the thing ends, and he said, now listen, that's why I said, I told you, I'm going to read, and I'm leaving, and I'm going. <laughs> And I walk out, and I, my agent calls up and says, what the hell, what, is, what are you doing? you got to talk to the guy. And I said, he kept me waiting, and I said, I'm not going to talk to you. So he said, you have to go in back in today and talk to him. I said, I'll, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. It was crazy. I had never done anything. And I had no reason to be doing this. Um, but somehow, the audition, you know, convinced him, so I came in and he, I sat down and he said, he said, how did you do that? He said, how are you able to, he said, you scared the shit out of me. I said, I don't know, I was pissed off. And he said, well, you know, okay, well, yeah, they, they said you only wanted to answer a couple of questions, so that's all I really needed to know. And then, then they offered it to me, and I turned it down like five times. I kept turning it down, they, they wouldn't pay, I wanted to get paid more than they wanted to pay me. Um, and finally, they, they paid me. It was crazy. I mean, it was, looking back, it's the stupidest shit I ever did. <laughs> but every time when we were, it was great though, when I did the movie, he would, you know, we were about to shoot and we would walk through and do like a little, and then start to shoot, and he'd come over and he'd say, just remember the audition. <laughs> just do the audition. So that's that story. You're, I mean, that it's a fantastic character, but there's a portion of that film where Francis Dollarhide is starting to date the woman from uh, the, the development place, and and you, Joan you, Allen. you yeah, Joan Allen, you forget Steppenwolf. for like for <laughs> from Steppenwolf, you forget for a solid twenty minutes in that film that this is someone who's just murdered a couple full families. And you become very interested in him trying to make this connection. Do you, I mean, I feel like you bring a really great human element to sort of monstrous characters. And I'm saying that's why you're good at it. I mean, I, mean, I, I just think that people that do all this horrific sh shit, you know, they're not that different than you and me. And I think that's my opinion. The culture sort of, you know, puts them aside as they're not really part of the human race. They're not people are not really like that. There's something really wrong with someone who does that. And I don't know if that's really true. Um, and part of what I try to do when I act in that stuff is, is to make them like a person. 
Yeah. Which is which makes it pretty scary. Definitely, it, it, it makes it very scary. I, you going from a heavy character like that a couple years later, you got you got to play Frankenstein. Yeah. And it's like in one of my favorite movies from when I was a kid, you got to play Frankenstein in the Monster Squad. And not only that, but it's like, was it Stan Winston makeup? Yeah, yeah, Stan did it. That's, that's incredible. Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Does everybody know Stan Winston? Yeah. It's a major trick. He's, he's really talented. He's a little motherfucker. He is. I decided when I was doing this part that I was never going to talk to these stupid kids. I was going to like, just treat them like another actor. So I so would talk to them and, and I would show up on the set and they didn't even know what I looked like because they'd never seen the, the transformation in the makeup. So they didn't know who I was when I walked around the set. Um, and where's the story going? Um, so so when, the only person I really related to in the movie was, was Stan. Because and I, and, I didn't have a lot of lines. and I. He's the only person I talk to, pretty much. And um, I, used to, I used to go, Dad, Dad, and like call him around. <laughs> like I was his kid. <laughs> so what he started doing was, he would start fucking with me when they did the makeup. He should, he should, you're in this like dental chair. One day he glued my arms to the, the chair. <laughs> Another time he glued my eyes shut. Because there's a lot of really delicate stuff, and it's very easy to do. You just go, you know, and you and the shit, you know, sets in my picky. Then we, they, when when you when you do special effects makeup like those the pieces they use, what they have to do is they they mold them and then they they cast them, but they have to let them sit for days and days to cure, so that for some reason that makes them look more like skin. So the, we got to the last day of shooting, and they said we got to shoot one more day, and we have no more pieces to use. So I said, I what the fuck? I'll wear it home and I'll wear it back. And I said, Yeah, I guess you could do that. So I and stand up and let them have me do this. So I go home and I come back the next day and shoot the whole day. And the movie ends, and they take the the, the makeup off. And what's happened is, is because it's been pulling on my face for like, I don't know, 60 hours. It has pulled the entire top layer of my skin off my face. And the, the, pieces, the pieces are hanging off my face with these long pieces of like blister. And so, they go make it stand because they don't know what the fuck to do. They're really scared that like killed me. And Stan comes in, he walks over, he goes, Oh, just, you just pulled the, pull the shit off. It's going on the ground. He said, it's just going to come on, it'll grow back. That's, that's Dan. We can, we can take some from the audience. I'm going to try to repeat the question briefly uh, so everyone can hear it. Does anyone have a question for Tom? Yes, on the aisle. Thank you, Tom. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I'm a school legend like yourself. Thank you for doing this with us. Uh, horror movies have always been my favorite type of movie. I just wanted to know what are a couple of your favorites, and um, what do you appreciate most about horror movies if you if you even are a fan of them? I mean, well, I, I loved them when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I loved them. Um, like, you know, Invasion of Body Snatchers. I loved the thing from another world, I used to watch this movie. There's a thing called Million Dollar Movie, I don't know if it was in around New York. And they would play a movie every day at 4.30 4 and 10 o'clock again. And then on Saturday and Sunday they'd play it like five times a day. I used to, every time they did a cycle with, with the thing from another world, I would just like live in, in, in our den. I would not go to school and just watch this. Um, there's some other movies back in that period too that I don't even remember. I remember seeing and being scared to death by it, but I've never been able to find them again. Um, but I love being scared. I, I just, it just felt so great. Um, and sometimes, for a long period, I, I didn't think movies were very scary. I, from the, after The Exorcist for, I don't know, like 10, 15 years, um, I don't know, it seemed like a lot of slasher shit, but the, the Paranormal Activity movies scared the crap out of me, <laughs> which I love. The Grudge, The Ring, those are pretty good. What about you? <laughs> uh, 
Texas, original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's sort of fun, too. <laughs> now, when they get in the van and that guy starts talking, it's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's one next to you. Yes. Uh, first things first, I just got to admit you scared the living shit out of me. Uh, you have the highest, car, highest compliments. You're great at what you do. Uh, uh, thank the you. devil is one of my favorite cars in the past, de past decade or so. But unrelated to the film, um, to your knowledge or to what you believe, do you believe you're responsible for the murder of Samantha Balder? What? That's an X Files question. <laughs> oh. he's, he's asking, uh, the question is if. Tom feels that his character on the X-Files was actually responsible for the murder of Samantha Balder. <laughs> I mean, I played it like I did. I don't know if I mean. Okay. There was a, I got a, they were, they were not going to kill me at the end of the episode. There was a big debate. Because yeah. in the script, I died. But they at the very last minute, they, they started talking. And they were going to let me live and come back. But then they killed me. <laughs> There was some general surprise going on over here, that, and then and then acceptance when they thought that this gentleman was asking if you had actually killed somebody. <laughs> that, that was that was a weird way of emotion. Like they were all gonna go with it. Does anyone else, anybody else have a question? I saw some hands. Yes. I will. Oh, please. I did this movie called. Robocop 2. <laughs> and yeah, it was fun. They, they, it was, you know, I like the free all that thing. I mean, I liked it okay. They cut most of the stuff that was good out of what I did. But. So about six months or a year after the movie came out, this guy in Middletown, New York, um, killed nine women, eight or nine women. And they're taking him away. And they arrested him and ran him to take him to whatever. They, the reporters start yelling, why'd you do it? And he goes, Kane made me do it. Well, Kane is the part I play in, <laughs> in Moby Cup 2. And apparently he, he believes that I was, you know, which is crazy. And what happened is that because they didn't have a lot of pictures of him on the newspapers and in the, in the headlines of the news at the, the day, they would, they would start talking about him, but they'd show you a picture of me. <laughs> And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I probably called up NBC directly. Just, I said, I gotta talk to somebody because you keep running this shit every day. It's been like a week. I mean, you know, I have children. I can't, you can't be. And then they stopped doing it. <laughs> That's a bum rap. That's what <laughs> yes. Hi, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, are there any interesting behind the scenes stories you have? From Manhunter? There are questions about any interesting behind the scenes stories from Manhunter. It's stuff I've talked about before, but you know, I'm not like a method person very much. I like to stay by myself and sort of just. But when Michael Mann came to me and said, Is there anything we can do to make it, you know, easier for you to do what you have to do? And I said, Well, you know, if I never had to meet the people that I'm trying to kill or the people that are trying to kill me, it'd be great until the, you know, the moment we do the scenes. So he puts out a memo saying that if anybody talks to me or makes contact with me, <laughs> that they'll be removed from the cast. <laughs> and he, he gets these two PAs, one to walk 30 feet in front of me and one to walk 30 feet behind me, everywhere we go when we're shooting, so nobody to warn people not, not to look at me or talk to me. And so, I don't know. I, it, it, it was... It, it helped a little bit. I made my sugar for anything I did. But one day the aide, the first AD came to my 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 room and he he says, "Oh, we're, we're gonna." He said, "D." They call me D all the time. Michael says, I, "Everybody call me D." Um, he said, "D, you know, we're gonna shoot the, the scene in about 20 minutes. Um, just want to let you know." And I said, "Yeah, thank you." And he starts to leave, and then he notices that it's that my my room is sort of getting dark. It's like dusk and he's, he says, uh, he reached for the switch and he says, can I put the lights on? And I said, Francis does, doesn't use lights. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, do you use that? So from then on, I couldn't put the lights on anywhere. Else. So the movie's all shot at night. And I'm like, can't in the fucking dark because I can't put the lights on because if I do, then they'll like, how's that? 
pretty good. That's a, that's a great answer. Any other questions from the crowd? Sure. Yes, right here. What's your favorite role? Like, what's your, of all the roles you've played, what's your favorite? Or one you're, like, most proud of? I mean, I really, I mean, I, I make movies. Yes. I write movies. And those are the ones that I sort of love the most. And I've had the chance to sort of sort of talk about stuff I want to talk about more. But those are different than, you know, ones that I've made. Um, I like the images. Nice. You know, like, thank you. <laughs> that was really, really funny. I mean, the money was terrible, but it was, it was, that was a really fun job. Well, at least you had fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure, sure, thanks. Was there someone up that way? Sorry, the lights are, the lights are bright. Raise your hands nice and high if you've got, yes, sir. So what are you working on now that you want to, that you tell us about? It? The question is what? I mean, I'm trying to write, I'd, I'd like to write something new and, and go back to directing more. Um, and I've sort of stopped acting a little bit the last year, year and a half. I got sort of sick of most of the stuff I was doing. And, yeah. Um, you know, and I, it's writing. I don't know if you guys, but writing's hard, and I, I used to, I used to do a lot of it, and I don't do. I used to do like, you know, I used to do five pages a day every day, no matter what, even if, no matter what it was about, for like 20, 30 years, which made it a lot easier to write. I, I just don't have the discipline or the, you know, the commitment to that. It's, it's hard for me to do that now. Um, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm really working on. And I, I play music a lot. Um, but it's just sort of an old ways. Anybody else? Hey, Mark, I got one up here. Oh, thanks, Tom. Uh, hey, so uh, you're in the Last Action Hero, which was a film I'm very fond of growing up. Um, so was it a unique challenge playing uh, two roles of, first off, uh, a character in a movie in a movie, and second off, a character of yourself in a movie? <laughs> He's talking in, in, in the movie, I appear as at a, at a Hollywood opening, as the, as the, the good version of, I don't, know, how did I, I don't remember how I ended up being. <laughs> and so I had to sort of act like I was the guy on a, on a red carpet who was really famous. And they hired, they, they got all these really great people. They got like Tony Curtis, um, John, John, what's, what's Van Damme's first name? John Claude Van Damme. <laughs> Chevy Chase. They got these people to hang out in the green room with me to like be my buddy. So when we went out to shoot, they would, I would look like I was comfortable being famous. <laughs> that doesn't happen in 20 minutes. So I was very uncomfortable playing myself. Um, it just it was just like horrible. I um, didn't like it. That's the answer. But I got to meet Tony Curtis, who I grew to be very close to. What's it like working with Arnold Schwarzenegger? who appears in this film series quite often. I mean, not in person, but you know. I mean, he's, he, he's okay. I mean, he works really hard. He knows all of his words. Um, he takes it really seriously. He's like, okay, you know, he's not terrible. Um, he, I don't think he likes me very much. No? No, he used to, his makeup chair was next to mine in the makeup trailer. And, and you know, he's, he's this multi-millionaire sort of like shaker and mover sure. Republican. Yes. Oh, so that's right. Yeah, I, so I had to sit next to him all day talking to, you know, George W. H. Bush yeah. and buying tracts of land places and <laughs> all his accountants and his lawyers are, are, are huddled around him while he's getting his makeup put on. And I would go, you know, Arnold, can you get these fucking people out of here? <laughs> he wouldn't he wouldn't talk to me after I said that. <laughs> but, was, but other than that, I mean he's a really you know, I, again I, I admire his Work at it and really works in the show. Do you still look at? I, I imagine that uh, people must send you horror scripts often because because you've been in such great yeah. great films and you've done your job very well. Do you ever? I mean, I'm sure it's few and far between. But has there ever been anything that came across that you wish you would have done? Uh, like maybe it didn't seem like a good role at the time, but then if it got produced. You say, oh, that, that one was for me. It's a terrible question. <laughs> I'm sure it's happened. I'm trying to remember. Like, I mean, something that I got offered and didn't do, and someone else did it and became 
got a lot of attention for? Or? Maybe. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to fill. I'm trying to fill time for these people who are not helping me. <laughs> Yes, right there. There we go. I knew that would be a catalyst. Yes, sir. Hey, Tom, I love your stuff. Uh, <laughs> cool. I'm going to go in the other direction with this question. Uh, is there anything in a script that draws you? Is there something that, that grabs your attention when a script comes across your radar? Language is a medium of manipulation, not of communication. So when I read a script where it's clear that this person is writing and understands that nothing anybody does is what it seems to be. That's, I don't know if that makes any sense, but you know. I don't want to know that melodrama is when what's on this, what you see is what you got, which is bullshit. That's not how people are. People are always fucking with you. They're always doing something to get something they need by not coming out and asking for it because that puts them at a disadvantage. And that's what makes drama work. So I can, and I can open a script any page and I can tell you whether this person understands that or not. You read two or three lines and you can tell. So it's rare that you, that, um, it's kind of coming off. Um, I don't know. That's it's probably going to switch. Probably just like that or <laughs> Was there another? I thought I saw another. Hey, yes, there's a couple here, right? In the front. Oh, thanks, Riley. Wow, we just had backups ready to go. And sell these on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so when you do something independent and low budget like House of the Devil for like under a million dollars versus when you're doing these larger Hollywood productions, you know, what are, what are the kinds of concessions you made or the challenges you face on a lower budget than you would when everything's all handled by studio? I don't know. It doesn't... Oh, they all, everything feels the same to me. I mean, the way I approach it and deal with it, I don't, I mean, I mean, when you don't have any money, what you do have is time. What's hard about doing a big budget movie is that it costs so much to set up these big set pieces that they can only do one or two takes. Whereas when you have, you know, a low budget movie, you actually, you actually have a little more latitude with what you do. Try things, you know. And it's much easier than I was pressured to, you know, keep the steamship going in the right direction. There's one on the end as well. Yes. Hi. Uh, so really love you in Hell on Wheels, and uh, really love you as the stew maker in Black. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time I got to see you, and I was like, oh, this guy's giving me shit. And that's how you're here tonight. So hi. Oh, um, but my question is, uh, you have like. You have like a very long career, and like you've done both TVs and movies. Um, but Such like, a young man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, since you did like, like my question is, uh, do you prefer staying on for like a TV show for a longer time? Since you did Hell on Wheels for a number of seasons, I think, and with like a movie, you can take maybe two to three months to shoot. What do you prefer? I've only done two TV shows where I was actually contracted to do multiple seasons. And Helen Wheels, uh, it was okay. It was pretty good. I mean, it wasn't amazing, but, you know, I hated that I had to be away from my kids. Um, so I, 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 that was the first time I'd ever had a job where I, every week I would come back and play this, sort of the same guy. And it was a very different experience because I would start, Normally in a script, if something's really stupid or makes no sense, I just say it. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I can say things in a way that makes it fun for me. But you have a part for a while like that. Um, I would become sort of possessive about the part, and they would bring in these new directors each week who would not have seen other episodes that I did and would have no idea what I'm trying to do and start to direct me. And I would just have to say, "Get the fuck." <laughs> I don't know, and I would get in trouble a little. And I think that may have caused me not to be kept on through the whole show. Because I started becoming more tr trouble for them a little bit, because I would start talking to other actors saying, don't say that, don't, you don't have to say that if you don't want, you know. <laughs> I don't think they loved that. <laughs> because I, I really wanted it to be great. Yeah. We've got time for just a couple more. Yes, in the front. Uh, so you're saying that, you know, 
be a pissed off in your audition helped you play uh, Francis Dollarhide. And I was just thinking about the character in this movie and how he seems more manipulator and kind of seems stressed out that his Neville plan might not work. You know? <laughs> I was wondering how you like found the vibe, what vibe you were going for with this guy. His anger seems like he's not a part of this character. I don't know, I just wanted to be a sweet little old man sort of talking to her and, you know, trying to... It just seemed like a fun way to do it and it just seemed sort of... It sort of just came naturally. I didn't really think about it a whole lot. Um, yeah. But there, I see what you're saying. There are these great flashes of frustration, like where you talk about... Where I almost jump up that when jump you, you almost jump up and when you start to talk about how your wife is on edge. And, uh, and, and you, you get like this glimpse and yeah, you really do feel like, you do, you do feel like uh, um, there's, a, there's a stress in this man's life. So there is like a, I, 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 mean, I kind of had a connection to the character in that way. Yeah, and, I was, and being married to Mary Warner. Yeah. Like, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> she scares me. <laughs> Um, time for, well, we've got a couple. Tony? Um, the, the amount of people you've acted opposite of has just been phenomenal. I mean, like, this and everything else. Is there anyone you've ever been starstruck that you've been working with? Like, oh my God, I'm upset with this place. The question is, has Tom ever been starstruck by someone he's worked with since he's worked with um, some legendary actors? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you, you really make an effort to not be starstruck when you're on a movie. It's pretty hard to win a scene if you think the other guy's better than you are. So, I mean, but I'm trying to, I mean, well, when I first started, Albert Finney sort of impressed me and uh, scared me because that was like one of the first things I ever did was a movie called Wolfen. And he, you know, he'd done all this stuff and he's amazing. And he's also an amazing person. Um, but he was so kind to me and sweet that it was, you know, I didn't feel like I was losing my edge with him. I just, I just really got him. Yes. Um, so I'm uh, I really enjoyed you and um, next to New York and Anomalisa. Oh, thanks. Um, would you? Uh, what, what What is it like working with Charlie Kaufman? Is it? Um, would you consider um, working with him again in the future or? Nah. <laughs> the question is what it's like uh, working with Charlie Kaufman on the film um, Tom has. This is very self-serving, but I guess that's what this is all about. It's all about. Um, I made this movie called What Happened Was, Woo! which is I wrote and directed. I'm in it. It's just two character play. And Charlie was living in Minnesota when the movie came out. I didn't know this. And he... He was living with his, with his wife at the time, and she said, this is a movie that's coming to, to, this, to, the, to the little theater in town for a couple nights, and they say, it's really good, you should come see it. And he said, I don't want to see the, I don't want to see a movie now. And she pushed him, she finally got him to go to see this movie, my movie. He saw the movie, he came home, and the internet had just started, and he, I'm online, very, I'm out there, I, I make, make it very easy to be reached. And he wrote this long letter to me saying he sat there and cried through the whole movie and that he, feel, he felt that he believed now that he could make movies, or he had lost that belief. So then he went on and he wrote John Malkovich and adaptation stuff. But I, had that, I still have the letter. I have every email I've ever been sent. And he, people started asking him, you know, what were the influences in his life? And he, work and he said it was me, which was sort of amazing because, uh, you know, but I didn't remember that it was, because I never knew that the, the one who wrote to me in 92 was not the guy that became famous as the him, so I don't know if that's making sense. No, it does. But um, how I, that's how I ended up working with him, is that he liked what I did and it, he created more interest in my work than I ever did by talking about it all the time. Um, so that's that's how I ended up working with it. It's been it, I'm very very proud that he actually sometimes I, I don't know sometimes I don't think I'm that good an actor. I think I, I'm pretty good at a couple of things and 
most things I cannot take good at, I can't do accents and stuff, but somehow working with him made me feel very confident and like sort of affirmed. Um, and it meant a lot to me. Uh, I hadn't worked with him in a while, but I did, I've done a bunch of things with him, and it's, they're always really amazing. And we are we're screening Synecdoche Key New York tomorrow night. Oh, that's right. And it's 9.30. Yeah. yeah, it's an earlier show, so if, if you guys have interest in coming back, we'll, we'll have another conversation with Tom following that. But I, I think this is a good place to wrap up. Sure. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Tom.